This is Dory Clark, and I am here with Cal Newport, and today we are discussing email and the future of work. Cal is a New York Times bestselling author. His new book is World Without Email, which actually sounds like a pretty great world to be part of. So we're excited to uh, to have everyone here and to have a, a great discussion with Cal about this. Uh, if you are tuning in live, please feel free to type your name and your location into the chat box. We'd love to, uh, to hear from you and to uh, hear a little bit more about wh who you are and, and what's on your mind. You can ask your questions to Cal uh, in the chat box as well. Cal, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. I was looking forward to this. Thank you so much. So Cal, uh, the first question that I have that I, I'm just sort of fascinated by. So you, you have a smartphone, but from what I understand, you have a smartphone that uh, it's a new smartphone, but you've, you've basically said you have it equipped sort of circa 2008 style. And that is how you keep yourself sane. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by this and why having a 2008-esque smartphone might be the a thing for, for other people to consider as well? Yeah, well, I, I have it right here. So there we go. <laughs> There's the, there it is as a cracked screen right now. Um, so what I mean by 2008 style is that there's nothing that interesting on it. Yeah, I, I have no social media accounts. There are no social media apps on there. I don't have email on the phone, so I, I can't check my email. What it's good for is I can text message with my wife, you know, so and she can and we can send each other photos back and forth when we're with the kids of the kids. Uh, and I can use the map. I get lost easily. And it's a great podcast audiobook music player. So it's basically the whole vision Steve Jobs had in 2008 before there was even an app store. I'm just sticking with his original vision and I find it to be a, a fantastic tool that makes my life better. But what it's not is a source of default distraction. What it's not is a way that I can numb myself in the moment if I don't want to deal with boredom or hard thoughts or something that's difficult in front of me. It's not that interesting to me. I still have to confront the world and the world around me, which I think is actually probably in the long run, good for me. So my my smartphone is dumber than most, but I'm still really happy with what it does for me. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, Cal. Thank you for that. And I just want to greet some of the, the great folks who are tuning in to join us. Carlos is here from Columbia, Robbie from Boston, Jeff from Seattle, Sandy's here from Oregon. Uh, we have uh, Anna from Vancouver, Linda from Atlanta. This is great. Rosinda from Mexico, Zhao Yu from Toronto, John from Cincinnati. We are thrilled to have all of you guys here. Please feel free to type your questions for Cal Newport, New York Times bestselling author of A World Without Email, into the the chat box. And Cal, I'm also curious. So in a world without email, you talk about how we now exist in what you call a hyperactive hive mind of work, which for, does not sound good. In fact, it sounds slightly terrifying. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what you mean by that and what the consequence is uh, for us to be part of the hyperactive hive mind? Well, the hive mind's really the villain of the book, much more so than email as the tool. So as we'll find out in this discussion, the title is a little disingenuous. It's not a book about the tool of email going away. It's really a book about this hyperactive hive mind workflow and being something that goes away. So what is this? Well, essentially, if you look at the history of email, it spreads through offices in the early 1990s for a very pragmatic reason. It replaced fax machines, it replaced voicemail, and it replaced office memos, and it did so because it was better. It was cheaper, it had more features, it was faster. And it's a very rational reason for email to spread. There's no reason to go back to those technologies once we have email. In the wake of email spreading for those very pragmatic purposes came unexpectedly and emergently, that is without any real intention or planning on our part, a new way of collaborating that I call the hyperactive hive mind, where we said, now that we have this easy to use, low friction digital communication tool, we can work most things out. Our primary mode of coordination and collaboration can be back and forth unscheduled messages. Just like if there's two of us in the same room and we're trying to solve a problem, we're just gonna kind of go back and forth ad hoc. Hey, what about this? Do you have this? Hand me the hammer. With email, we said, we'll just do this for everything. Just back and forth, ongoing, asynchronous, unscheduled messaging. The problem is it doesn't scale. If you have three people working on one thing, then sure, put them on a Slack channel. They can rock and roll. It's kind of a natural way to do it. But when you have 
14 other colleagues you regularly work with, six vendors and seven clients. There's also the HR department and the marketing department and the, the, the parking office. And with all of them, you have multiple back and forth unscheduled asynchronous conversations going on. The sheer scale of messages that started arriving in people's inboxes took off. And it isn't just the quantity of messages that makes the high find so damaging. It's the fact that these messages are part of an unscheduled back and forth. So you have to hit those ping pong balls back over the metaphorical net pretty quick because there might have to be seven or eight back and forth messages to resolve a certain issue. And if you wait six hours before every message, it'll never get resolved. So now you not only have a lot of messages coming in, but you have to get to them pretty quick. So the result is now you have to constantly check. You have to constantly check an inbox. You have to constantly check Slack just to keep your business operating. It is these checks that has become what I call a productivity poison because our brains cannot context shift like that. It is a very expensive operation for us to change our attention from one thing to another. And so when we glance at our inbox, because we're waiting for these ping pong balls to come over the net, it initiates these context shifts, which we then abort to bring our attention back to the main thing. And then we try to shift back to those. And then we abort that to go back to the email inbox. And it's a whole cognitive pileup. It makes it very hard to think clearly. It fatigues our brain and it makes us anxious. So the hive mind is the enemy. It is the thing I think that we need to get past. It is something that no one planned. It just emerged naturally in the wake of email. The real title of my book should be A World Without the Hyperactive Hive Mind Workflow, but the good people at Penguin would not let me use that title. <laughs> I, I feel you on that, Cal. That I think a lot of people can really relate to that. And we have some wonderful friends tuning in from around the world. Gabrielle is here from Bucharest, Romania. Ramon from Long Island. Todd from New York City. We have Harsha from London. Uh, we have Yusuf from Muscat and Ludmila from California. Linda from Orlando. We're so happy to have you here. Feel free to type your questions for Cal Newport into the chat box. Uh, we'd love to uh, to hear from you. And Cal, a question that that arises with all of this. I mean, so you are the author of a, a great book that that I loved. Uh, in fact, Linda loved it too. She said, "Deep work had a real impact on the way I plan and work." Uh, but so, deep work came out in 2016. I'm actually curious. In your mind, was this the logical extension? You know, deep work is is sort of a, a peon to the virtues of focusing, doing uh, meaningful, longer term projects, not necessarily being uh, distracted so quickly as with email. W w did you basically write this book because you completed deep work and you're like, wow, email is the enemy. This is the beast I have to slay next. Yeah, I started this book right after deep work. So I started working on this book in 2016. I actually put it on hold and wrote Digital Minimalism, which I released in 2019 and then came back to email. So Digital Minimalism felt like it was incredibly timely at the moment. That's why I switched the order. But this was logically the book to follow Deep Work. And it's because the immediate feedback I got from Deep Work is you don't realize how impossible it is and how frustrated I am, how impossible it is to get any time to do any sort of undistracted thinking. And I just thought this was a huge question. Why? Why are we working this way? Who thought it was a good idea? What is the problem we're solving by working this way? And the story that uh, uncovered and became a world without email is that no one really decided we should work this way. It was emergent and unplanned. Two, it's a lot worse than I thought even when I was writing Deep Work. And three, there's so much productivity and revenue and profit on the line here. There's so much growth in the knowledge industry that's being held back by this terrible way that we work that it is inevitable that we're gonna evolve the different ways of work. And the question is just, what are those gonna look like and how quickly are you gonna get there? These three threads came out of the aftermath of deep work. And it took me five years to really report on them fully because these are big topics. But once I was done with it, I thought this is a huge storyline that affects a ton of people and affects our economy as a whole. And it was exciting to finally get this out. Yeah, I, I love that. Thank you, Cal. So I'm curious, you know, obviously you you reveal all of it throughout the course of, uh, of a, a very substantial book, but I'm wondering if you can give us some highlights. I mean, certainly there's some people, there's some advocates out there that say, oh, you know, email's done. Nobody wants email. Do Slack instead. That will solve the problems. You have said 
eh, you know, not not so fast. Everybody trading 100,000 Slack messages uh, is not necessarily the solution. For people who do feel mired and oppressed by the hyperactive hive mind, by their inbox looming, what are a few suggestions or solutions, both at the enterprise level and at the individual level, that you might suggest to relieve some of that pressure? Well, I think the biggest thing we've been getting wrong is thinking about this as a problem that's going to be fixed with inbox habits. So this is how I think we've been thinking about since inbox overload became an issue, which was in the early 2000s. The way we've been thinking about this is we just fix like, oh, these e email messages in your inbox, that's all a given. You have to have better habits. You got to batch your checks. You have to turn off your notifications. There's a real pressure from technologist types who tend to be way more instrumental about tools, which is, look, a tool is a tool. If you're using it wrong, that's on you, right? We got a lot of that. We were looking at often email overload through a lens of personal addiction. If you remember the Crackberry terminology from the 2000s, well, you're just addicted to your email. You have bad email habits. You write bad subject lines. Or we blame each other. You have bad norms. We need better expectations. None of that's going to solve the problem. And I think this is the, the, the sort of key inversion I'm trying to do with this book. If the underlying way that your organization collaborates is through unscheduled back and forth messaging, you have to check your inbox all the time. And if you don't, it causes problems. And that's the big problem with, well, I'll just fix my habits. I can't check it, my email less often if these back and forth messages is how things get done. Because if I say I'm not going to check till four, all of these things stop and it causes a real problem. So once you realize that, you say, oh, the solution has to happen underneath the inbox. It has to actually happen in the underlying agreements we have about how specific types of work gets done. And this is the mindset I really want to instill is that whether you're just making changes about yourself or whether you're trying to make changes in a team that you lead or even at a whole enterprise level, this is the mindset that you have to adopt. In knowledge work, there are different things you are doing. I call them processes that it's repeated types of efforts that you do week after week, day after day, month after month, whatever. These are the main things I do again and again. You have to go through these one by one and say, what are the rules and the guidelines and the systems we actually want to use to get this work done, including how we communicate and collaborate around it? You have to be specific about it. Once we're being specific about, oh, here's how we do this, here's how we do that, you can start to optimize for the right thing. And for me, the right thing to optimize for is how do we get this work done while minimizing unscheduled messages? Unscheduled messages is what creates that urgency pressure in your inbox or Slack that requires you to have to check all the time because you don't know when that message is coming. But when it does, you have to be ready to knock it back across the net. So you go process by process. How do we want to do this? How do I want to do this that will reduce unscheduled messages? The answer to that question is going to look very different depending on the work and the process, what we're talking about. It's not about a tool. It's not about one rule. It's about this process-oriented thinking. That ultimately is what actually defangs the hive mind. You defang the hive mind by replacing it not by having better armor on when you go to do battle with it. Such an important point. Thank you, Cal. If you are enjoying this conversation, you want to learn more about Cal Newport. His new book is called A World Without Email, and you can learn more about all of his work at calnewport.com. Additionally, if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly conversations hosted by Newsweek here, uh, every Thursday we have the show Better. It is 12 Eastern, 9 Pacific, and you can make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to my LinkedIn newsletter uh, at doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, just hit the subscribe button. So Cal, we had some great questions come in. Uh, this one from a uh, an anonymous LinkedIn user who wants to know your thoughts uh, sort of appertaining to, uh, to your deep work phase here. How can we maintain deep work when we're almost all communicating digitally and work-life balance has dramatically eroded? We don't have the option of dropping by somebody's office or the water cooler chats. Phone calls can be a hassle sometimes. What are your thoughts about work-life balance and deep work in the COVID slash virtual era? Well, the, the unexpected virtual work moment of the last year made the hyperactive hive mind for most people more hyperactive. So it took the pain points I talked about in this book and made them all worse. And there's a few different reasons for this. One is, as was mentioned in this question itself, there was all of these informal productivity heuristics that we deploy when we're together in an office, and we we perhaps underestimated how much time that saved us. This is the grabbing someone as they walk by in the hallway. Hey, 
can I ask you a quick question or informally before or after a meeting, you, you know, like, do you know anything about this event coming up? This sort of informal back and forth. Uh, another thing that happened in person that we lost during COVID is there was a more pronounced social capital cost to putting obligations on someone's plate. So if I have to see you, I might think twice about just casually saying, hey, can you handle this? But when we're all just abstract people sending Slack messages back and forth, we tend to throw things on people's plates much more uh, furiously. Also, uh, Zoom meetings went up during this period because there's a lot less of friction or cost to setting up a Zoom meeting than there is to actually get people to have to gather in a room where you have to look them in the eye and see that they're kind of frustrated that they're there, right? So we, we had a lot more meetings. So the hyperactive hive mind got a lot more hyperactive. Now, the issue is in general, if that's the main way your, your organization operates, we just rock and roll on Slack, we rock and roll email, we figure things out on the fly and set up Zoom meetings when, when, when in doubt, it's very hard to have a work-life boundary because the high mind is always churning. There's always incoming conversations where you need to knock the messages back and forth. You're in this chain of dependencies that things are arriving at all times. Every minute you're away from that is a problem. And that's how work becomes the setup of, okay, anytime I'm not working, has a negative impact because the hive mind's churning. There's more and more ping pong balls waiting for me to hit them back. And it's very difficult to maintain a work-life boundary when not working is linearly correlated with how much of a pain you're being to everybody else. So to solve this problem long-term, again, it all comes back to replacing the hive mind. We get more structured about here's how we do this type of work. This is when and how we communicate about it. Here's how we move the information around. Here's how we do this work. This is when and how we communicate about it. Here's how we move the message around. What about questions that come up that aren't captured in one of these processes? Well, let's think about that too. Maybe we have office hours. There's three times a week where it's advertised, I am available. You can jump into an open Zoom room or call me and I'll be right there. And if you have a question on one of the other days, wait. Companies do this, turns out that it's fine. Uh, we can do asymmetric meetings, reverse meetings. I talked about this in a recent blog post. Well, wait a second, instead of me taking five people and making all of them come to my meeting for an hour, maybe I have to go to each of their office hours one by one and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I'll spend more time than the people attending my meeting have to. And now overall, we're much more effective. So once we get clear, here's how we actually want to do things and here's what we're trying to optimize, and we can do a lot better. If we don't fix these underlying systems though, and just let the hyperactive hive mind churn and then just, uh, rage against the hive mind and say, well, I, you know, stop bothering me or don't have emails after this hour. Or I'm going to batch my emails. If we try to fight the hive mind instead of replacing it, that's where the wheels come off the bus. It, it causes frustration. It just doesn't work until you have an alternative way to actually collaborate and get things done. Trying to tame the hive mind into something that's more tractable is essentially quixotic. I, I think that makes perfect sense. So let let me take our our time uh, together here, Cal, to just e ex exploit your brain power for my benefit. And here is what is on my mind. I actually did some time tracking uh, in December of 2018. Uh, I did a month worth of time tracking. I was spending about 1.3 hours a day doing email. I repeated the experiment in December 2020. Uh, I was then spending about 1.5 uh, hours per day on email. So, you know, in increasing as one might imagine. And like everybody else, it's the bane of my existence. I'm self-employed, um, you know, consulting, executive coaching, writing, uh, et cetera. So it's harder to um, set group norms the way that one would if you are inside an organization. For people who are self-employed and just sort of get a lot of messages from a lot of people, what would be your top strategies for improving the quality of our lives? Well, there seems to be a, a common strategy for people who think a lot about these issues and are client facing, right? So they're solopreneurs or have small companies and do a lot of interaction with the outside world. Uh, and that this common principle is clarity often trumps accessibility. So a lot of times you're in a relationship, let's say with an outside client, where in the moment they really demand you answer their messages really quick. We tend to extrapolate from that and say that's because that's what they really want. Bottom line, they want full accessibility. But really what's happened here often is there's a lack of clarity about how you interact, how questions are asked, how things are taken care of. And in an absence of this type of clarity, now let's think about the client for a second. An issue pops up involving your work with them. They don't want to keep track of this in their head. They're probably not super well organized productivity geek types. They probably don't have some sort of David Allen style system where I can put this in a tickler file and it'll come back up in three days and I won't forget it. It's like, ah, I have this thing. 
I don't want to have to worry about this thing. Let me just shoot an email over to, you know, this, my, this solopreneur I work with right away. And it's going to be in my head till I hear back. So I just hope they just, they just need to answer me quick. And then I can, ah, I don't have to worry about this anymore. And suddenly you have a culture of accessibility. But then in my book, for example, I, I highlight a lot of small companies that replace these cultures of accessibility with very clearly structured client communication processes. And the clients were fine with it because it's as long as it solved the problem of if there's an issue or a question or whatever, I don't want to have to be responsible for keeping track of this or being worried that it's going to get dropped. Because if that's the case, then I'm just going to wait until I confirm a solution. So one example that came up, for example, small UX firm in London, they started having their clients sign an agreement. This is how we communicate. And what they did was a, a weekly call. And at the end of this weekly call, they would write down here is everything we said, but also everything we committed to. And they would send this right over to the client, right? So it's documented in black and white. Here's what we said we were going to work on and the client can see it so they don't have to worry about it. If the clients had questions or issues, they knew like, oh, this call happens every Monday. So that's great. Uh, we just have a list of these things we talk about in the call. And because they give us a written record, we, we trust things aren't going to get dropped. They were super worried. How possibly are all these clients who are used to hectoring us on Slack all the time? How are they possibly going to be okay drastically reducing that accessibility? And no one cared because it turned out the accessibility was just a proxy for, I don't want to have to keep track of or worry about things in our relationship. If you give me an alternative way not to have to worry about that, that's fine. Just give me a way not to have to worry about it. So we have a lot more flexibility and autonomy than we often assume in these contexts to structure how this interaction happens with the outside world in a way that, that preserves our cognitive capacity, but also keeps the clients happy. I love that. That's a, a really transformative point, Cal. That's great. So we had a question come in from a longtime fan of yours. Harsha in London uh, has a call back to a previous book of yours, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And he wants to know uh, if the, you've talked about, you know, the idea of following your passion. And uh, of course, that's something that's of, of great interest to, to lots of people. Should we? Should we not? How do we think about it? Uh, Harsha wants to know, since public publishing so good they can't ignore you. How has your thinking evolved in this area? I think that the main ideas of that book, I think, still hold up. Uh, I, I, and I still sort of stand behind it. I mean, the very quick summary there is that the advice to follow your passion, I believe, is way too simplistic. It, it pre-assumes a pre-existing passion and that where uh, satisfaction comes from in the work environment is the match of a job to a pre-existing passion. I still stand by my alternative, which is that for most people, a passion is something that you cultivate. So your goal is not to follow a pre-existing passion as much as it is to cultivate a career that you will feel passionate about. And my theory that career capital plays a big role, that is you get good at rare and valuable skills then use those skills as leverage to shape your career. That tends to, that still is, I still stand by that as like probably the most consistent way to end up really enjoying uh, your career, really finding passion in your career. And I stand by my ultimate critique that if you simplify this too much, to a Disney movie, you were born to be a you know social media brand manager for a Fortune 500 company, and, and once you match that pre-existing passion to your job, you'll live happily ever after. But if you don't, then you know the evil queen is going to smite you. Um, it's way too simplistic, and when we make it too simplistic, it creates a lot of confusion and anxiety, and people are wondering why don't I love my job? Is it not my passion? I'm going to switch my job 20 times. It doesn't help to oversimplify things. So. Um, I, I, yeah, I stand by so good. By the way, interesting book. It it sort of came out under the radar. I think it was largely seen as maybe not a big success. I got paid less for deep work than I got paid for so good, which preceded it. But under the radar, it sold hundreds of thousands of copies. It's just, it's sort of been out there and percolating. Uh, so I think there's something to it. There's a whole generation that's realizing, yeah, follow your passion. That's too simple. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. If you are tuning in and enjoying this conversation, please hit the like button and the share button so your friends and colleagues can benefit from Cal Newport's wisdom as well. Again, the book is A World Without Email. You can learn more about him at calnewport.com and you can sign up to receive my e-newsletter and regular updates about our weekly Newsweek show at doryclark.com. So Cal, another question that I'm curious about is you 
famously uh, are, are not on social media. And so, so many people who are authors, uh, in fact, are told by, demanded by their publishers, you must be on social media. This is mandatory. They're looking for the stats. They're looking for the, the numbers in the platform. Um, I am curious, um, especially in the early days. I mean, now you have built up a reputation for yourself. People are aware of you and therefore it becomes self-perpetuating. But in in the early days of your uh, career, how were you promoting books? And how did you work to sort of get that initial momentum around getting your ideas out there without uh, utilizing social media? Yeah, it you know, it's a good question. When When I was first coming up in writing, I did my first book deals in the early 2000s. The big thing back then was email lists, which actually, ironically, today has reemerged as the major thing. <laughs> actually, email list size is considered much, much more important than, say, social media following when it comes to converting audience to book sales. Uh, if you look at someone who has a 100,000 person email list, that is exponentially more useful from a book sale perspective than someone who has half a million Twitter followers. Social media actually turns out not to be a good driver of book sales, at least in terms of an author's own following, social media tends to be more helpful for book sales in that it helps other people who like your book talk about your book. And I think publishers understand this a little bit more. I mean, I, I still think there's too much pressure on uh, social media platforms in particular right now, but this is the way I understand social media's role in book publicity is it reduces the friction in people who love your book to tell other people they love your book. That helps. Me as the author telling my followers, my book is coming out. Uh, okay, that is of, of I think much more limited value. So, so how do I actually do it? Well, I have built up an audience, and I do have online platforms. I just don't like the social media companies, and I don't want them to have anything to do with my online platforms. So, I'm a early internet geek. I was someone who was a heavy user of the internet before the World Wide Web even existed. I love its potential for expression and connection. I just didn't like that these small number of large companies were created their own private versions of the internet where they could observe everything and control everything. So I've had a website for a very long time. I've been writing on my blog, a weekly essay since 2007, right after my second book came out. And over time, I think two things have helped me. One, my privately owned personal domain where the server's in Michigan somewhere that over time has built up an audience that has kind of grown up with me and my books and knows me and trusts me, no social media involved. And also just my initial books spread slowly, word of mouth, uh, but they've just spread around. And there's just hundreds of thousands of people who over time have come across these books, have read these books, enjoyed the books, like my style, see my name on the book. So it's just old fashioned, write books that matter, let them spread. And then I'm built up a platform. It's not huge but it's, uh, people can find me on the internet. They can subscribe to my mailing list. They can get my weekly essays. As of this year, they can listen to my podcast. Again, a very democratic controlled thing. You know, you own your own, there's a server, your podcast are on. It doesn't go through a large company. And that's just how I've done it. And so ultimately writing books that are very good and controlling your own platforms has been more than enough. And I think the counterfactual in which I have a large social media following would not include substantially more book sales. And if anything, it would probably include substantially less books because I would be so distracted by how alluring these things are that I probably wouldn't get the writing nearly as much. I love that. So, so interesting and useful. And Cal, I think we have time for probably just one more question. This is one that probably a lot of us can relate to. It comes in from John. He wants to know any thoughts on the dreaded meeting that could have been an email? How do we, how do we think about that? Obviously email has, uh, has pros and cons. Um, what do you think about this situation? Well, whenever we deal with workplace uh, technologies, there's dichotomies and we have to be comfortable with dichotomy. So just like with email, we have this dichotomy of fax machines are terrible and I'm very glad I can use email instead. And at the same time, the hyperactive hive mind is terrible and it's making my life miserable. Both these things are true at the same time. Well, if we look at the world of meetings, there's two things that's true at the same time. One, real-time back and forth communication is significantly more efficient when it comes to interactive decision-making than asynchronous communication, right? Email is better for broadcasting or delivering information. If an interactive consensus or decision has to happen, real time is exponentially more uh, efficient, right? Where we can just go back and forth. It's much, much better than let's just have emails go back and forth. At the same time, 
current Zoom culture is terrible and making people miserable, right? Both of these things are true at the same time. So why, what, what's going on with the current Zoom culture that is making people miserable? I think what's happening is that a lot of people are using meetings as a proxy for productivity. So something new comes on their plate, something they're responsible for. They're perhaps not, again, super David Allen organized where this is going to go onto my 10,000 foot list and will get reviewed regularly and I'll make sure I make progress on it. It's a responsibility that they, that's an open loop. Ah, how do I make sure I get progress on this? Well, the one productivity system that everyone actually uses is a calendar. So they think, well, if I put a meeting on the calendar to discuss this or a standing meeting to work on it, I get the relief of I can let this go from my brain because when I get to that day, I will follow what's on my calendar. It will get talked about. And so because I think we have a sort of dearth of more formal, personal, organizational type strategies, people are increasingly using meetings as a proxy for productivity. And that creates way too many meetings. You get there and you're like, wait a second, you don't even know what this is about. You just like vaguely wanted to make sure that we, you know, you knew you're responsible for this project. So you just put a meeting on the, on the calendar. So I think that the key is we need highly structured ways of using synchronous communications like meetings for very effectively dealing with interactive decisions that need to be made, but those have to be deployed very intentionally and they have to be very structured. So you can have some combination, for example, of office hours that can capture many quick decisions or discussions in a set amount of time. We can also borrow ideas from agile methodologies like structured standing meetings where it's, okay, we come to talk about this project, but it, the meeting is very structured. Person, person, person. What happened to the thing you were working on? What are you working on now? What do you need to get that done? Where should people put that information? And by when? Great. Next person, right? Five minutes a person. Go, 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 go. Out of here. Let's work, right? So highly structured meetings. You're very intentional about what you're trying to work with. This is the dichotomy of meetings. If everyone is just throwing meetings on the calendar because they don't trust themselves to get, make progress on something, all we do is meetings. On the other hand, if we don't do interactive interaction and everything has to be asynchronous back and forth messages, the hive mind spirals out of control. We have to find how to balance both of those demands. I think it's very possible once we know what it is that we're trying to accomplish. That's awesome. John appreciates that. He just says, so good. So clear, clearly you are not being ignored, Cal. Thank you for that great answer. Uh, this is Dory Clark. I am here on behalf of Newsweek with Cal Newport. The book is A World Without Email. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. And Cal, thank you for being here and sharing your insights. Uh, well, thank you. I, I, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Take care and, and see everyone in two weeks. We're back on April 22nd with William Green, author of Richer, Wiser, Happier. Take care, everyone.